morning and welcome to Hattiesburg Community Church. Please stand and join us as we worship this morning. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for god so Michael Mergen's leading us in worship today. Brother Ed is on a mission from God going to Disney World, and uh, he should accomplish a lot while he's down there. You pray for him and his family while they're gone, and we pray God's going to bless us. We appreciate Brother Michael, Super Talk Radio from Mississippi. He's here. If you need to get on the show for free, just see him after the church. He'll probably help you out there a little bit. 
couple of things that are coming up. We have a blood drive that's going to be taking place, and uh, that will happen tomorrow from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. If you need to sign up for that, we certainly hope you will. You can see Martha Williams. There will be somebody out front there. You can call and ask, and we'll get you hooked up. And we've got Miss Beverly here today. And we pray that you'll come and help us. We had probably the largest giving of blood this last time we did a blood drive uh, that we've ever had in the history of our church. And this goes to help people and there's an emergency crisis situation right now. So if you can help, uh, help us out tomorrow. And we appreciate that. We have some people that are going to be going to camps this summer. And so different people are asking us to get deposits in. So our children's camp for grades third through sixth graders will be at Shaco Springs, Alabama. And they've had a wonderful time over there the past two years. And so if you want to see Miss Nancy or find out, you'll see some information here. You can call the church office. But it's time to get our deposits in there. You may want to sponsor a child that's going to church. And we would encourage you if you so choose to do so. And uh, also, we've got, all, I think Ed's got Disciple Now coming up next month, the uh, first part of February. And so if you want to sign up for that, that's going to be down at Paul B. Johnson State Park for all of our students. And I think that's something like $30. That one's pretty cheap. And so if you can, we'd love to have you come and be with us there and be a part of that. We'll also be doing kids camps here uh, for the younger children. So just be in prayer as we put together our calendar for all the things that are going to be taking place and things that we need to do. We're going to be in a series in uh, January called Finding Forgiveness, one of the favorite stories in the Bible, Genesis 37 through 50, where it deals with Joseph and his life. And I praise the Lord for the patience and the compassion that's in Joseph's heart to honor God no matter what he goes through in life. And what a beautiful story it is, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So Ray and I will be preaching through that, finding forgiveness. He'll preach the first two. I'll preach the last two of January. And then in all of our Sunday school classes, our adult Sunday school classes, except one, uh, we'll be teaching through that as well. And uh, if you're a young adult and you're looking for this year a Bible study group uh, to get in, I want to invite you to come to mine if you're a young adult. You say, how old is that? That's anywhere from out of high school to you're still alive. And uh, you're welcome to come. We meet up here in the first room. And this morning we had a guy bring cookies from Italy. Can you believe that? They were Italian cookies. And I didn't eat one, but I thought about it. And uh, we had enough for another 20 of you if you want to come. Come join us. And get involved in a Bible study, and we praise the Lord for what God is teaching us and what he's going to do this year. If you're visiting with us today, we ask you to please uh, pick up a visitor's card on the back, tables back there. Also, there's an outline of Ray's sermon this morning. You can pick that up, and uh, we want you to be involved and be a part of this. When it says, bring your failures and bring your addictions, for God so loved the world. Last night, we have a guy that's been coming here. His name is Philip. He comes on Saturday nights, and he lives in a halfway house in Hattiesburg. And uh, every week, he brings new people. He had four guys here last night. And uh, I looked at them. We got to hug on them and love on them. And you know what? They're just like you. They just had some failures, and they're, they're trying to overcome some addictions in their life. And so, listen, there's people sitting around you that may need a word of encouragement, may need some joy of the Lord, and we're fixing to stand together, and maybe you could give that to them with your smile and your love today. Stand with me if you would. Find three or four or five people. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord this morning.
Shall I fear? Who then 
You. you can be seated. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, praise team. Musicians, if you have God's word, Genesis chapter 50. All right, how many in the room have had God forgive a lot of things in your life that you've done against him? Just raise your hand and hold it up. The rest of y'all need my sermon on lying, right? We've all messed up. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned against God. We all have a lot of things that God had to forgive us of. So we've all had to find forgiveness vertically from God back down to us so we could be set free from the wages of sin that should lead to death in our own lives. But God forgave us and put the penalty on his son, Jesus Christ. He paid it all so you and I could find freedom in forgiveness. So how many in the room have had somebody that hurt you? Somebody that offended you? Somebody that did a wrong against you, right? So the same people who have found forgiveness from God have to be able to give forgiveness to somebody else in order to be set free. And we're going to find forgiveness through the life of one who knows it better than anybody else, and his name is Joseph. Joseph gets more airtime in the book of Genesis than Abraham, the father of our faith. Genesis 37 through 50. Skip chapter 38, because that's about you know, Judah the whole time. But he gets all those chapters at the end of the book of Genesis. He's found in 16 different books of the Bible. Three times his name shows up in the New Testament. He finds himself in the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Why all this about this guy named Joseph? Why does God want everybody to know the story of what happened with Joseph? Because he knows how hard it is for us to give forgiveness that have been given forgiveness. Have you ever found it so much easier to receive forgiveness from God and you've wronged him and then not want to give forgiveness to somebody else who has wronged you? And I want you to think about Joseph for just one second. Joseph has a dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional father, put in a pit, sold into slavery, seduced, falsely accused, in prison. He spent from age 17 to about age 30, 13 years of his life, enslaved because of his brothers, nine of them, ganged up on him, wanted to kill him, but threw him in a pit. You think, man, how does Joseph get to a point of forgiving? 
How does he get to the point of actually setting somebody free who did all that to him? He could have been so bitter and lost so much of his spiritual journey, enslaved to his own thought life. But he would be able to say in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, to those same brothers who did that to him, what you meant for evil, God turned it into good. So how can we learn to find forgiveness? First of all, we have to define it. So I want to give this first message on defining forgiveness because I'm going to give you a couple levels of forgiveness because I want you to see them so you can understand them. Then I'm going to give you four lessons of forgiveness that if you've forgiven someone, this is taking place in your life. Because we all know in the room, just because you say you forgive someone doesn't mean you forgave them. Just because you say I'm sorry doesn't mean you're sorry. So how do you know you've really forgiven someone? How do we know Joseph truly forgave his brothers? But here's the definition of forgiveness I want you to think about. We're using this in our Bible study classes. Forgiveness is an act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that is a result of a wrong done against you. See, every time someone sins against you and every time you sin against God, it's like the cash register goes off for the wages of sin is piling up. Cha-ching. There's a debt that's incurred. Every time somebody offended you, every time somebody did you wrong, every time you've been lied against, every time you've been cheated on, cha-ching. And the debt is piling up. And somebody's got to pay for that debt. And somebody's got to release it and let it go. And that's why forgiveness is such a serious, serious issue. And it puts us all on the same playing field today because all of us need it. All of us have to find it. Because we're really in three categories. We all have given God grievances. We've all offended him. We've all offended somebody else at some point in our life. And we've all been hurt by somebody else. So we have several different levels. We're going to have to learn about forgiveness. Let's go to the rest of the story, the end of Joseph's life. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, all that happened to him, he forgave them. He finally gets to see his dad, Jacob, before he dies. Then Jacob dies, and his brother said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. In other words, he might have just been nice while daddy was alive because he didn't want to hurt daddy. Now daddy's dead. Now he's going to get back at us. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Liar, liar, robe on fire. How do they know that Jacob sent a message if he's dead, right? How do we know they didn't write it themselves? Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brother's and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Here's my question. Why does he weep? If you know the story of Joseph, you're going to study it through your devotion and Bible study. He's already wept the first time he reveals himself to his brothers. Years goes by. He's forgiven his brothers. He set them free. They've actually asked for forgiveness. Jacob dies. The brothers still are dealing with the guilt of the sin they committed against Joseph. And when they're still asking for forgiveness that Joseph has already given, it causes Joseph to cry. Why? Because even after all that they did to him, Joseph still wants them to live free from it. He doesn't want them to live in guilt. He wants them to live in God's grace. And so I want to give you, these are very important, so listen carefully to these two levels of forgiveness. And these are the, my terms for them. If you don't like them, you're going to offend me. And by the way, I hope you're taking notes. You've got six blanks to fill in. I've got a photographic memory, so I'll know where your sheet of paper is when you leave it on your seat when it's done. <laughs> Moses. Level number one, all right? I call it releasing forgiveness. Releasing Forgiveness. Now, listen to me, church. This forgiveness is when a person has done something against you and the person hasn't asked for you to forgive them. Got real quiet. 
This person may not even admit they did something wrong, and you know they have. This person may never say they're sorry. They may never come to you and say, I was wrong for what I did. So why is it called releasing forgiveness? Because it releases you. Now, why is this so important? Because there's some people right now in this room that you want to receive forgiveness from somebody who is not here any longer. In fact, they're dead and gone to heaven. And they did something against you and they died before you got the forgiveness. And listen, if you're waiting for them to say they're sorry, you're going to die before you get released from it. Some of you have been offended by somebody and you don't know where they live. You couldn't find them if you tried. You couldn't find them anywhere in the United States of America or abroad. But they've done something against you. And if you're waiting for them to say that they're sorry so you can finally get out of your bitterness and get out of your grudge, you're never going to get there on this side of heaven. But you can find a way to release that person so you can go on in the journey called the Christian life. How do I know? Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Father, forgive them. Did they ask for forgiveness? Did anybody at Calvary say, please forgive us for what we're doing? But he forgave them even when they didn't ask for it. He released them from the burden of it, and they didn't even ask for it. He said, because they don't even know what they're doing. You're never more like Jesus than when you forgive. But if you can't get to the point of releasing what somebody has done to you before they ask you to forgive them, you're never going to be all that God called you to be in your spiritual life. Some of you are going to be stuck in your past bitterness, miss the present God has for you, and miss the future God has planned for you because you're waiting for somebody to say they're sorry and you're holding on to it. And I tell you, church, I believe with all my heart that Joseph released his brothers before he ever saw them 13 years later. I believe Joseph found forgiveness and released his brothers because you won't hear one word in Genesis 37 through 50, not one word of Joseph saying, why is this happening to me? This is not fair, what they did to me. This is not fair that I'm in prison. He just kept trusting God each step of the journey. So that's the first kind of forgiveness. The releasing forgiveness, it releases you. Here's the second level of forgiveness. I call it restoring forgiveness. Now listen, church, this is where somebody who's wronged you confesses what they did, repents of it, and seeks to restore a relationship with you. And if they do that, biblically, you're supposed to seek restoration. The Bible says in Corinthians, we're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation. So this type of forgiveness restores relationships. It restores something that has been broken. Joseph's brothers want to be forgiven, but Joseph didn't take them at their word for it. When they said they were wrong, Joseph tested them three times. So listen to me, church. Just because somebody says they're sorry doesn't mean they're sorry. Just because somebody says I was wrong doesn't mean they won't do it again. Doesn't mean you automatically trust them just because they say they're sorry, but you can seek to restore a relationship with them without trusting them, but instead you can test them. So three times, Genesis 42, Genesis 43, and Genesis 44, Joseph gives them a test. In fact, it's in Scripture. Genesis 42 reads this way, verse 15. By this you shall be tested. He's telling his brothers, I'm testing you. Now, they don't know who he is yet. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. It's Benjamin. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested whether this is truth in you. He says, y'all are spies. He's testing them to see if they've changed any since they threw him in a pit. And they said, we're not spies. Our father Jacob has sent us and we have one brother who is no more and one, the youngest, is still with the father. They tell him the truth. He knows the truth because he's their brother. And so he tests them. He says, all right, I want you to go get your youngest and bring him back. And he keeps Simeon with him. 
and said, I'm going to hold one of your prisoners. You got to bring him back. And when they go back to Jacob, Jacob says, why did you tell him you had a younger brother? And they said, Daddy, we didn't know if we told him we had a younger brother, he was going to ask for us to bring him. We never thought that was going to play out that way. And Jacob says, I'm not, I'm not going to send a Benjamin back. I've already lost Joseph. I'm not lost, losing Benjamin too. And so they stay there until all the grain they had ran out. But you remember what happened the second test? Joseph puts their money back in the top of all their grain sacks in Genesis 43. And so they, they find all their money back in the top of their grain sacks. And they get home and they tell Jacob, they said, Daddy, the money's back in here, but we paid them. So when they finally run out of grain and they get, need food bad enough and they send Benjamin back, you know what they tell Joseph when they get there? Test number two. The money was back on our sacks and we didn't put it there. They're honest. After they had been dishonest with Joseph and threw him into a pit and lied to their daddy about it. And then he says, bring Benjamin. And guess what? He sends him back home and they put a gold... A silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Third test. Why does he test them? Because you can't trust somebody who just says they're sorry. But if they pass the test, seek restoration. Why? Simple. Because God's forgiven you. But Brother Ray, you don't know what they've done. Remember, I've got the spiritual gift of seeing the bubble above your head. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea how many times they wronged me. You have no idea how many times they hurt me. I don't, but I know how many times I've hurt God. And not one time has God said, I'm done with you. I'm not forgiven anymore. Every time I repent and seek to restore a relationship with him, he's always faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And so the first level frees you. The second level restores relationship. And I'm telling you, church, Joseph had both. And that's why he had the attitude that he had while he was in a prison he didn't deserve to be in. That's why he had the attitude he had when he lost 13 years of his life because of somebody else's hatred and wickedness. And so, let me show you four ways, four lessons about forgiveness. How do you know that you've forgiven someone? How do you know you've gotten there and not just saying it? Go back to Genesis 45, the third test, and I want you to see this. I want to give you the scripture, and then I want to show you four ways we know Joseph actually did forgive his brothers and didn't just say he did, and how you can too. Genesis 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. Got them all back around the table. They're all sitting in birth order. They're all looking at each other. The Bible says in amazement, like, how did we get in birth order? He cried, make everyone go out from me so no one stay with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He sent everybody out. And he wept aloud so loud that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. He's crying his eyes out. But he sent everybody out of the room. Listen to me, church. This is huge. You don't bring other people in who have nothing to do with the sin. That's how you know you've truly forgiven someone. You know how you know somebody hasn't forgiven someone? They gossip about it. They can't wait to tell somebody else about it because they're wanting to get vengeance and not forgiveness. Somebody's done something wrong to you and if you haven't forgiven them, you tell everybody what they did to you. Even the people who had nothing to do with the sin. You know what Joseph does? He says, no, the Egyptians didn't have nothing to do with this. All you Egyptians get out of the room. I'm going to deal just with the ones who hurt me and we're going to talk about what happened he actually forgave them because he wasn't bitter about it. He wasn't trying to confess their sins to the whole world. In fact, you've got to get the Egyptians out. If you're going to find true forgiveness for what somebody's done to you. So here's the question. That if you say you've forgiven someone, how many times do you still bring it up? And who do you bring it up to?
it was Corrie ten Boom, famous missionary. She was having a trouble with forgiving someone that wronged her and God Post shared this story. She said she kept rehashing it and kept rehashing it. She couldn't sleep. Finally, after a couple of nights of sleeplessness because of this bitterness she had about the person who had wronged her, and she said, I, I thought I'd forgiven her, but it just keeps coming back up in my mind. She went to speak to a Lutheran pastor. And the Lutheran pastor took her up to a church tower and he showed her the, the bell with the rope in that church tower. And he said, now notice, you know, when you ring the bell and he rang the bell with the rope, he said, when you keep on ringing it, it keeps on ringing, but when you let go of the rope, it's still going to ding and dong and ding and dong and ding and dong for a while before it finally stops swinging. And then that Lutheran pastor said, same way happens with your forgiveness. He says, when we forgive, we take our hands off the rope, but it still dings and dongs for a long time in our hearts and our minds. And that's why forgiveness is not just a one-time event. It's a process. And he said, but sooner or later, the dings and the dongs will slow down and finally stop if you let go of the rope and quit holding on to it. And here's what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, and I quote, I discovered another secret that day of forgiveness. We can trust God not only above our emotions, but also above our own thoughts. Translation, God can take away the pain from the offense. He can actually finally take it out of the thought life. It can happen. You just got to keep trusting God with it. But if you truly forgive someone, you don't bring other people in who have nothing to do with the sin. Second thing, next two verses, Genesis 45, verse 3. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Can you imagine that conversation? 13 years. They didn't know if he was dead or not. They know what they did. 13 years, and he said, I am Joseph. The next question out of his mouth, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. You ever did something terrible to somebody else, and then they walked in the room? So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. Highlight that phrase, underline it, we're coming back to it. Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. He didn't back away from what they did to him. He said what they did to him. I'm your brother, and you sold me into Egypt. But he said, come near to me. Second, you know when you've forgiven someone, when you make the offender feel at ease with you. When you make the offender feel at ease with you. You know you haven't forgiven them when you say, get away from me, I never want to see you again. I forgive you, but I don't ever want to see you again. And Joseph didn't do that. Joseph said, I want you to come near. Not get away. Come near. That's huge. Because I know, I've, I've counseled people who said, I, I forgive them, but I never want to see them ever again in my life. Would God ever say that to you? Ephesians 4 says we forgive one another as in Christ God has forgiven us. God would never say, I forgive you, but I never want to lay eyes on them again. So you know you've forgiven them when you're trying to make them feel at ease with you, not have still tension every time you bump into them. Third, look at Genesis 45, the next verse, verse 5. This is huge. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. Now before we ever give number three, look at this text in verse 45. He says, you sold me, but God sent me. That's huge. You did what you did God was still in control. You did what you did. You sold me. God sent me here. 
See, I believe he had releasing forgiveness before he had restoring forgiveness. He had already set them free from their offense because he had the perspective that God was still who God said he is no matter what was happening to him. But look at this. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. So the third way you know you've truly forgiven someone is when you help the offender find forgiveness when they've asked you to forgive them. You help them find forgiveness. I know what some of you are thinking. I see the bubble again. No, they're going to pay for what they did. I hope they get it bad. I hope they get it worse than what they gave to me. You know what Joseph wanted? He wanted them to find the same forgiveness he had found. So he said, don't feel distressed. I don't even want you to be stressed out about what you did to me. And I don't want you to get angry at yourselves. I want you to be able to forgive yourself. I want God to set you free. Now, is, has anybody been offended by their family the same way Joseph was? Anybody, anybody tried to kill you in your family and then they sold you into slavery for 13 years and you got in prison for 13? And that happened. And his first encounter back with his brothers, he says, look, I don't want y'all to get upset about it. I don't want that to hold you hostage. You're in your life. I don't want you to be a prisoner just because I was one. I want better for you than I have for myself. I want you to have God all over your life. And he did one more thing. Skip to verse 9 of Genesis 45. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, watch this church, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You notice what he didn't tell his brothers to tell daddy? He did not say what you and I would say, go tell daddy all you did to me. Go tell daddy how you sold me into slavery. Go tell daddy how you ripped the coat that he gave me off and told him that somebody killed me and made him suffer all these years. Go tell daddy what you did to me. Go tell daddy what God did for me. Why? Because number four, you know you've forgiven when you protect those who would have been most hurt by the offense. He still loves Jacob. He still loves his daddy. No sense in heaping all that on his daddy now. No sense in his daddy going through all that pain of what his brothers did to him and what he had to endure. No sin, nothing good's going to come from telling daddy when I've forgiven them. But see, if you're not careful, hurt people hurt people. And forgiven people forgive people. It's all about how you focus. If you focus on your hurts, you're going to try to hurt back. But if you focus on the fact that you're a forgiven person and you've needed to find forgiveness too, you'll want the other person, no matter what they did to you, to be able to find forgiveness so they too can be set free and you can too. In fact, I got to share this story. I found this story the other day, and I'm not big on history. Brother Cliff's the history buff, but I've been studying the lives of presidents, and I came across James Garfield and a story about James Garfield. He was a lay preacher before he was the president of the United States, and he was a principal of this denominational college, and they say he's one of the smartest men who ever walked on the face of the earth. He was ambidextrous. They said he could write Greek in one hand, and at the same time he's writing Greek with one hand, he could write Latin in the other hand. And in 1880, he was elected president of the United States, but after just six months in office, he was shot in the back with a revolver. And he never lost consciousness. And at the hospital, the doctor probed the wound with his finger trying to get the bullet out. He kept probing with his finger, and he couldn't find it. And so he tried a silver-tipped probe, and he stuck the silver-tipped probe in there trying to get the bullet out, but he couldn't get the bullet out. So they took Garfield back to Washington, D.C., and despite the summer heat, they tried to keep him comfortable, but he kept growing weaker and weaker. Teams of doctors tried to locate the bullet. Teams of doctors kept probing and probing and probing, trying to get the bullet out, but they couldn't get it out. And in desperation, they asked a guy named Alexander Graham Bell, who was working on a little invention called a telephone, if he could come over and try to help get it out. He came over and he probed and probed. He couldn't get that little metal bullet out of the president's body. And the president hung on through July, through August. But in September, he finally died. 
And listen to me, church, not from the bullet wound, but from the infection that came from the probing. The repeated probing which the physicians thought would help the man if they could get it out eventually killed him. Listen to me. So it is with people who dwell too long on what people have done to them and they just keep letting the bell ring and keep grabbing the rope again and they refuse to release it to God. Unforgiveness is a sin that leads to death that you can't find freedom from until you finally release it and let it go. Next week, I'm going to give you two things that were birthed in Joseph's life so he, that I believe with all my heart helped him get there to find forgiveness. And we're going to talk about them next week. But I know what some of y'all are thinking, so I gave you one more verse. Here's what you're thinking. They don't deserve to be forgiven. Neither do you. But if I forgive them and don't make them pay for what they did, they'll do it again. Listen to the scripture, Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Never. Under any circumstance, avenge yourself. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Listen, God believes in justice. God believes in holding people accountable. And he's the judge and jury and you're not. And you've got to trust that God can do what he says he's going to do. Let me give you a quick illustration and we'll close. The one who had the most to do with the nine brothers who had the idea of trying to kill Joseph and then sell him into slavery was Judah. That's why in Genesis chapter 38, there's this whole chapter that stops right after Joseph's story starts and deals with Judah. And because when you read the story of Judah in the middle of Joseph, Judah loses two of his sons to death. He gets tricked by his daughter-in-law. He has an affair with his daughter-in-law, gives birth to twin children from his own daughter-in-law. His life crumbles around him. In fact, we looked at Tamar in the pictures of grace. All that happens to Judah. Joseph forgave Judah, but he trusted God to judge Judah. Are we tracking? Listen, if you want to get payback, that's all they're going to get is your payback. If you can release them and let them go, God will deal with them. Your two options or to hold on to what's been done to you and get bitter or trust God with it and release them and find God's blessing in your life. That's your two choices. And again, it's a process. We got real quiet in here last night when we got to the invitation time because I can't imagine what's going through your minds right now on the events that's happened to you or that you've done. I just know my own life. And the greatest display of Christian love to my life is the one I've hurt the most. I still got consequences. But there's a restored relationship that I don't deserve. See, God sent His Son because you and I need forgiveness. And God keeps the Holy Spirit in your life prevalent because you need to be able to keep giving it to other people because you're always going to be offended by somebody because we live in a fallen world. And if you keep holding on to it, you're going to live a bitter, miserable life. But if you can trust God with it, He can set you free.
God, in this room, there are people that I, I don't know what they're going through, but you do. I don't know what they're holding on to. I don't know what they need to release to you, but you do. I just know in my life where I would be without forgiveness. And I pray, God, today that if there's anybody in this room that's not received your forgiveness yet, they've never trusted you to be their Lord and save their life, that they would find your unbelievable forgiveness today and the day would be the day of salvation for them. And I also pray for people who have been forgiven to get to the point of being able to forgive. That they won't bring other people into the situation who had nothing to do with their sin. They would even want those that offended them to be at ease and find forgiveness. And they won't any more hurt to come from it. Instead, they want healing because that's what you've done for all of us. God, it's going to be the key to 2024. It'll be the key to us living in the destiny that you have for us, living in the future. The more that you have for us in 2024, the key will be if we can on a regular basis find it in ourselves to forgive. So teach us, God, over these next few weeks what it means to finally get there. As we look at Joseph's life, thank you for that great example you've given us in Scripture of getting to the point of living from the perspective of forgiveness. Next week, as we look at these two things that were birthed into his life, I'm praying you birth it in all of our lives. God, you sent your son so we could experience the fullness of life, not live in prison by the chains that we use to shackle ourselves of bitterness and grudges. And I pray today during this invitation time would be the start of you setting some people free. In Jesus' name, amen.